Right, there's the title of my talk. Mildly controversial, because, well, that's what you do when you get accepted for a conference. Here is the nice big disclaimer, because I work at a giant corporation. And moving on. <laughs> Who am I? I'm Mike Ellsmore. I'm a developer advocate. You don't have to agree, it's for me. It's, for, it's essentially to say, whatever I'm saying could be a lie, don't listen to me, you don't have to take any of it's truth. That's all. Uh, Internet of Toast is what I'd prefer to go with. Right, I'm Mike Ellsmore, I'm a developer advocate, there's my email, feel free to spam me. It's essentially what emails are there for nowadays. Um, I work here at IBM Cloud Data Services. Our entire thing is about taking databases and operationalizing them as services for you. So I work with that stuff. So Spark, CouchDB, which is Cloudant. I don't know why the name correlation is slightly different. DashDB, uh, Compose, which is, who here's heard of Compose? Mongo HQ. Wow, I'm talking to a crowd of people in NoSQL room who've never heard of NoSQL company. But yeah, and Graph Data Store, which is my current favorite because it's weird and wonderful. But my day usually starts like this. Around lunchtime, ends up like this. And if by the end of the day I haven't reached this, something's gone horribly wrong. Uh, I'm going to own up now. I'm not an expert in what I'm going to talk about. I'm just a tinkerer. I play with everything, but it doesn't mean I'm an expert at it. So feel free to correct me. Oh yeah, just an open point, heckling is okay. So, rant. The controversial bit. This bit does actually genuinely get me a little bit angry. Um, it can't be helped, but that's the way it is. No SQL. Who has heard of this term? Please tell me the entire room has heard of it. So you all have a rough concept. So SQL, try. If it's not, it's no SQL. Ugh. Christ. Not SQL, that horrible backronym uh, they try and explain NoSQL is, oh, it just said that so that we can explain everything that's not NoSQL. Nuts to that. SQL is on NoSQL. Who here has tried Cassandra? Oh, that's a few of you. So you've, come, uh, you've seen CQL, so a select table, et cetera, language. Looks just like SQL, works kind of like SQL, doesn't have any joins. Sparkle and Couchbase recently released one. That's SQL on no SQL. So the whole it's not SQL thing is BS. Try to learn how to be polite in front of you all. It's kind of difficult. Schemaless. Yeah, you can throw whatever the hell you want to a no SQL database, supposedly. It's true. You can throw it a JSON format or whatever, YAML. I believe you can even throw XML. Just throw it at it. It'll accept it. It'll work. Balls to that, because as a developer, you can throw what you wanted it, but you need to know the scheme to pull it back out afterwards. So by nature of de being developers, you imply a, s a schema on a schemaless database, because you need to know what you're getting. So I call bull. Anyone agree? Yeah, fair enough. There are no such thing as no SQL experts. Who here would put their hand up and admit there are no SQL experts? I'm going to point at you. Oh, nobody can take that bullet. There are like over five different types of database. So these are distinct groupings of technologies that do specific jobs that are not connected to each other, but they're all called the same bloody thing. You look at the marketing jargon on the website and they would pretty much sound like the exact same technology, which is stupid. I hate marketing people. Ex-expert, you can be an expert in a specific technology. It's who here would say they are a developer expert? Right, that's true, because some people would say I'm a Ruby expert, I'm a Node expert, I'm an expert in the technology I use. No SQL expert, well, yep. end of rant. Mm -hmm. ah. so. <laughs> Hello, I can hear you. <laughs> Obviously they can't hear me. Ah, so time to calm down, prepare before I actually give some educational material. I swear this isn't me. I, this is not ventriloquism, look. Right, so, I'm sorry about this. Now for something a bit educational. I'm gonna drop some silence on you all, yo. Who here has heard of cat theorem? So, Balker's theorem. Right. 
No, it's not me. That stands for consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Consistency, what you put in is what you get out. So you put one in, you get one out. You put two in, you get two out. I'm not meaning individual records, I'm meaning the number. That's kind of pretty much self-explanatory. Available, well, it's a service that's always going to be there. That's pretty self-explanatory as well. Partition tolerance. What this actually means it is uh, safe for network failure, so when different nodes from a cluster drops off. I like to think of it as the machines know where the information is. So it knows which partition and shard to look at. It handily comes in a nice Venn diagram. Diagrams are nice. This, I've just got to point out, this bit here doesn't exist and is impossible to exist. There is no way you can get a distributed system that is CAP. It's just not possible. Anybody who says otherwise, I call them out. Well, that may be the running theme of this talk. Right, so with that problem, you have to pick two. You have to be consistent and partition tolerant. You have to be available on partition tolerance. It's kind of like the uncertainty principle. Who knows what that is? Oh, that's surprisingly few people. You know, the whole, when it comes to particle physics and quantum physics, you can know where a uh, atom is or where it's going. You can't know both at the same time. That's the most lame explanation I've ever given of it, ever. I don't think I could even do a more complex one if I tried. Why is this important? Uh, well, a little bit of history. We've all been through the good old days of consistent and available systems. So who here started their development career with some form of SQL service? Oracle, DB2, MySQL. Right, the way they got around partition tolerance in this problem is the fact they just stuck it on one machine and when the machine got, well, full, they just put it on a bigger machine and then eventually that got full and they put it on a bigger machine and eventually the racks went dry and they put more rack. Yeah, they just knew where the partitions are so they could be consistent and available. It's, you know, kind of makes sense, it's quite simple easy enough to get rolling with. Problem in comes these distributed systems. It needs to know where the information is on so many different machines. So at one point somebody went, yay, commodity hardware is cheap. Let's make stupidly big systems that can do ridiculously complex things and be cheaper than buying a supercomputer. And yeah, so the partition tolerance actually became fundamental in how you designed it. So once that becomes a fixed thing, you, can ha you have to choose between the two. Unlike SQL, where they can just go, big fat box, lots of memory, lots of hard drives. These things are designed to run on 16 gig, like, actually, I think the smallest CouchDB instance I've ever got successfully running was on a Raspberry Pi. So you can go crazy and build a 12 node Raspberry Pi cluster, and it'll do the same thing as a like, big one in the sky. Well, when I say in the sky, in the cloud. So you can be partition tolerant and insert availability or consistent. I think that's even actually the right amount of spaces for it. Yeah, as you can be, oh right, yes, I got it right. So with those fundamental design decisions, most databases went AP or CP, they didn't try and uh, subscribe to both. It's uh, like they also tried and failed in most cases staying acid because trying to be able to do transactional data from things which are going to different places and you don't know what's going to happen, you don't even know what order they're going to go in, yeah, it kind of makes it more difficult. So, types, the ones I'm going to be covering. These are types of databases, not types of variables or anything like that. I actually have never used the strict programming language ever, so I couldn't actually even try to talk about that. So key value, document, column, graph, and that's it. There are hundreds of them. Well, I wouldn't say the hundreds. There's 167 projects in the Apache archives, including 318 incubator projects currently. And in there is a massive scope of data projects ranging from frameworks to different object stores. So object, tabular, tuple, triple, which is based on RDF. Uh, so you may have heard of Apache Jenna. And multimodel. I'm not going to touch multimodel because that's like saying it's the Swiss Army nice of databases. It will do things. Things will happen. So we'll skip over that because it's just, well, too much like hard work for um, half past four in the evening. So first up, key value databases. Can anyone name any of these? 
Redis. Anything else? Yeah, that, yeah. That's the one I that actually took me forever to remember what that was called. <laughs> so there's three most popular ones that are available. There is luckily a website dedicated to ranking the popularity of databases. Yes, they're all that big a nerd. <laughs> so Redis, Memcached, React. Basic principle is it's um, associative arrays. So it's all done on hashes, dictionaries, whatever you want to call them. It is information in an object or a string or whatever type you want to throw it in at that's stored with a key, key value. So pretty self-explanatory. They're really the simplest to use. Why would you use them? Well, the best example I've been trying myself personally is just using them to replace sessions. Who hey, here usually throws in Redis to do that? Wow, you're a tough crowd. <laughs> so yeah, Redis can do a lot of things, actually. Should probably ah, give myself my notes. Ah. Yeah, so. Uh, oh yeah, also because they're literally just a dictionary, they're ridiculously fast to look upon. You can't really do anything stupid beyond, is it this? Yes, have it. And I've also recently been throwing Redis into queues. Previously, I'd only ever used RabbitMQ, but it turns out Redis is really good at that. And I never thought because I thought it was too stupid for it, but it turns out it's actually pretty good. So document DBs. Can anyone name any of these? Come on, people, be interactive with me. There we go, there's two. There we go, Cloudant, because that's where I work and they paid me to come here, so it's kind of, I need to put their name on there somewhere. So yeah, Cloudant, which is CouchDB. CouchDB, oddly enough. Mongo and Rethink. I should have put DB on the end of that. Oops. That's a typo, just ignore it. It's not there, really. Um, yeah, Rethink DB, which as far as I can tell is what somebody went, I like Mongo, I like this bit. Let's make it better. So, once again, what is a document data store? Um, in large, most people consider them to be a subclass of key value stores because their basic pattern is ID document. But then they've introduced the complexities of things like MapReduce uh, and fasted searching, relying on the metadata of the document itself to provide a complex query type. So Mongo's find one being a ridiculously complex system which runs on an internal mapped engine. That's actually pretty clever. And they've built that on top of a key value store, essentially. And with Couch, you've got the recently uh, Lucene-based multifaceted search system. So who has heard of Lucene? Who here has sworn at it because it works just a little bit too much like solar? OK, that's most people. Um, so yeah, you, can, um, you now have the ability to do ad hoc styled complex querying inside of a NoSQL system. Um, isn't that what SQL's for? Once again, why would you use it? Um, okay, anyone got a suggestion why you would use it? Because most document stores follow an AP system. All right, okay. Um, oh yeah, I'm going to be teaching you, aren't I? So I'm going to be giving you the information. Um, most people, most systems use it as the operational data store. So. It's not a series of record, it's not for archiving, it's not for active uh, batch queries for analytics, it's for the stuff you use immediately. So user records, account information, client table, stuff that you actively just do stuff with. Um, and they're also majority AP because if you have a product on the internet that is running on a database, you don't want your database going missing. That's just not cool. SQL errors, oh, I can't connect to the database. <laughs> Uh, run. Um, and with some of the systems like Couch, uh, Mongo when it's running at massive scale, uh, Cassandra, they all follow a principle called eventual consistency. Who's heard of that? Who has stabbed themselves in the foot because it's a pain in the ass to architect a system around? Yeah, there we go. At least one person owned up to the hatred I have of my life every other week. Eventually consistent systems are wonderful because it means they are consistently available for you to query, but when you query it, you could get old information or no information because it hasn't existed in the whole cluster yet. Have fun with that. It's great if you want your system to be available. It's not great if you want to make sure that what goes in is exactly what you're getting out. 
So be careful, be warned. Can't say I haven't given you some useful information today. Next one, column stores, otherwise known as wide columns. Can somebody name one? Druid. Druid, yes. I discovered this one yesterday and Googled it last night. <laughs> thank you for one of the other speakers who pointed me out to that last night. Put up your hand so I know where you are, so thank you. There we go. There's also, most popular one is Cassandra. It's actually a wide column database, which once again is based on key values. So the popular ones, Cassandra, HBase, Accumulo. I didn't know about that one, but that's supposedly the third most popular non-multi-model version on the DB ranking website. <laughs> so there's a top three for you. Um, so what is one? It actually does follow a table column row process. It, it essentially, it doesn't look like an SQL table, but it essentially is how it stores it. The difference is, so it is kind of relational, but there's no joins, there's no group buys, it just is a table. It's like having a CSV file that you can easily get into. Uh, however, it does have the amazing thing of, it can just ignore columns. It can just change the format of the information inside them. So you can treat it like a single column relational table, but you don't have to give a crap about typing. That's always kind of useful, right? So why would you use them? Um, some people use them for operational stores. They are very good at this. Um, the biggest people I can think of would be Netflix, which I've discovered last night isn't available in Estonia. I feel sorry for you. It's amazing. Everybody should have Ola the VPN. Um, but due to the size of the model, you can do it mostly in relational, but due to just the size of the data you're using, you wouldn't do that in a relational database because the indexing would just be ridiculously slow and you'd run out of drive space before you actually got anywhere. But they're amazing. <laughs> these things are amazing for being massively distributed. Network failure is not a problem for them. Who here has looked at the Chaos Monkey reports for uh, like Netflix on their Amazon clusters? Seriously, just read them. It's insane. It's like your worst nightmare as developers. Oh shit, half my entire system has just disappeared. Last, I think it was last month or the month before, they, Netflix just decided to kill an entire region to see what would happen. That's an entire region of AWS that just went off. What would happen, I'm guessing everybody here, if they were like me, would have the same response I have if that happened. And that would be quit and move to Hawaii. But no, they did it just for the lulls. And they did this on live. They didn't do it on, well, a fake system. They did it on a live data system and Cassandra stood up to it. So, yay, it can fail. It, can ne it is network failure tolerant. I would not say it's a fault tolerant data system because that's a lie as well. Anybody who says their database is fault tolerant lies. I'm, yeah, I'm not really actually speaking the virtues of NoSQL. It does have an amazing stuff, but there's a lot of stuff that people bull about. Right, my favorite topic at the moment, graph, graph databases. Who here did graph databases at, well, graph theory at university and plays with graph? Right, so you all know what it is. These things are amazing. Who can name one? Anything else? That's a multi-model. I'm avoiding multi-model ones because that's like saying, this is all of them. Yeah, no, it, it turns out nobody really is known. Star dog is one, yeah, but it's a proprietary one. So yeah, popular ones. Titan DB, which is built by Aurelius, which recently got bought by Datastax, who were the main developers for Cassandra. Wonder why that? Oh, Titan DB works on top of Cassandra. Go figure. The F4J in Giraffe. I spun that up last week just to see what happens. It turns out the Facebook engineers aren't as crazy as they seem. They can actually build things that aren't that crazy. It's true. Half the stuff that Facebook turns out is great, but it is from the minds of the deranged and shouldn't be employed. So what the hell would you use a graph database for? So you've got the whole traveling salesman problem, which now we have massive amounts of commodity hardware we can actually solve cheaply. I think somebody actually went and did that in IBM research for no apparent reason other than the fact that they proved they could. That was a few million dollars just wasted on a lot of hardware. Um, so the whole thing is built around nodes and edges, and you can do all this inside of a relational structure. If you know how far the information is apart, you can just go join, join, join. Ah, there, there is a graph-related structure about it. But you shouldn't, because when you don't know what's going on, that's going to explode. Um, this does rely heavily on the metadata, so they're the edges, essentially, between nodes. They are technically objects in their own right, but 
when you look at the actual how it is kind of structured, it is metadata. Why the hell would you use it? As I said, you could do some of this, if not most of this, inside of um, a relational database. So why the hell would you use it? Oh, wow, because there's these things called cyclical problems and these weird things where information can go talk to itself. And as far as I can tell, last time I tried doing that in my SQL, things went bang. Anyone tried doing a join on the same information that tried drawing on itself again and again and again and then worked out why their entire system had fallen over in a test? Ah, oh, nobody's owning up to that. Uh, oh, there we go, somebody who's being honest with me. Yes, because I know I've done that previously a lot. It's that wonderful thing, oh, this will work, uh, that shouldn't work, stop, 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 stop. But yeah, so it allows for complex, iterative, cyclical um, queries where the information can just go around on itself. This solves the Bacon, yeah, Kevin Bacon problem with IMDB. It turns out IMDB are actually researching this in Bristol to make a proper ERDOS number for Kevin Bacon. <laughs> I find that fantastic. So you've got social graphs, ERDOS numbers, finding the degrees of separation between any individual. You've got recommendation engines. LinkedIn has one of the most complex graph systems on the planet, which they will not give away, which is damn them because that stuff's powerful. And I, I only found this one out last week from somebody in IBM going, oh, this will make a great client. Fraud detection. Turns out you can do that in graph by just checking how people are making their spending patterns and how it's working at any one time. It turns out it's a thing. But then again, eh, let's ignore it. You can do fraud detection. So, what we've learned. Oh, got to get used to using the clicker. What we've learned. No SQL is a lie. Who here would agree with me after that bunch of ranting statements? All right, you're all like, you're all completely and utterly chuckling, but oh, will you agree that no SQL is a bullshit term? Oh, there we go, so the majority of you. Who here is going to actually go and look at NoSQL and actually learn what the individual things do rather than just go, oh, it's NoSQL, it's shiny and new and I'm never going to use it in production. <laughs> okay, nobody's only got to that. So, we now know why it grew up the way it did. Because of cap theorem, because of distributed machinery. NoSQL wasn't really a thing <coughs> and couldn't really be a thing on big box hardware because there was no need for it. With commodity hardware, we had the need, the use and the ability to learn from it. So, we know where it came from. And we now know that these different databases are for different jobs. They have tools that work for the right situation. Who here has had that horrible thing where they've got, well, stuck with a client piece or something from their boss and they've just gone, ah, nuts to this, I'll use it in the same programming language I always use with the exact same database even though it really shouldn't be done and really should never be seen on a production server. Nobody's owning up to having to do that. Okay, one person has owned up, I will accept that. All of us have written horrible code for people we didn't want to write it for. It's fine. So, if you're picking the wrong tool for the job, you're just gonna get nowhere. I love this GIF. This GIF made me laugh so hard. <laughs> but, if you do it right, you get the right tool and everything just works. It's, yeah. So, I'm Mike Ellsmore. That's the talk. That's the information. There's me if you want to spam me for stuff on Twitter and everything. Pub. <laughs>